subject to which I've been asked to address you today is growing up and growing back a maritime community. And I want to bounce off what our Minister for the Environment, Rosanna, was just saying there. And it's so interesting that in Scotland we've got a number of politicians with considerable personal depth at how they come to the issues of what makes for an environment and a community. I want to bounce off what she was saying there about the wider social and economic benefits of the maritime community. I'm not here as any kind of an expert on marine policy or the exciting developments that are taking place there. I'm here to talk to you about this. And hopefully I'm not up the proverbial creek. <laughs> I brought along this paddle here because for eight years I lived in Kinghorn, just a mile along the road from here. My son still lives there in a tree house at Craigenhall Farm. And I regularly come back here and I take young folk out in our two inflatable canoes into the sea around here. And any of you looking at this paddle will say, well, it's much too short for him because you're meant to have a paddle that comes to just below your chin for an open canoe type thing. But this is what I use for the youngsters because I think back to the childhood I had growing up in Lewis about the way we were connected into our community by the older generation. We were reached out to is what I call that touch of blessing. Like when an old woman might just tap you on the shoulder or an old man might just give you a wee half wink like that and say you've not, you've no done bad or something like that. We had things passed on to us that we didn't even know we were carrying at the time. And that helped us to grow up in our maritime communities. And it gave us the skills that helps us to grow our maritime communities. To reconnect coastal communities like we are doing in Govan in Glasgow with the Gal Gale Trust, of which I'm a founding trustee where we are rebuilding traditional designs of boat and then taking them out onto the Clyde and down the Clyde and connecting urban folks with their rural hinterland so that the fullness of what is Scotland can enter into people. Now growing up on the Isle of Lewis in the 1960s where my father was a doctor in North Loch's the way it happened is that very naturally, usually what we would think of as the old men in the village, probably just my age now today, would take us out in the boats, I'm talking here late 60s, mid 60s, late 60s, to around 1970, 71. And in those days in Loch Lurbost or Loch Vimshadow or Loch Eresort, the ones that I would be going to, you could drop down a line when the tide was about, you know, about half tide just coming in like this. Good tidal flow running. You could drop down a line and in a very short time you'd have haddies, whiting, flatfish in the summertime, mackerel coming in. I was talking to somebody, um, to Lucy in the Creighton Quality Ecology Centre this morning by social media and she was saying, tell them to bring their binoculars because there's minky whales and dolphins out there just now. And the taxi driver was telling me the mackerel have just come in. So I'll be coming down here in my canoe and I'll be taking some of the younger ones out so that they can experience that. And that's what we would do in Lewis. And that act of us going fishing connected the whole community. In those days our work was often gendered. It would generally be the women who would collect the mussels that we would use as bait out in the boats. I remember when I was maybe about 13 one day, I was wanting to take the boat out alone and it was quite windy. 
My mother was very worried about it, and my father said, no, let the boy go, because the old buttocks will all have their telescopes trained on him, <laughs> and if anything happens, they'll call out the boys. Well, that may or may not have worked in time, but basically, we were put in situations where we were able to engage with our environment in a very visceral way. But it was a whole community. And when I would catch a bucket of fish on the way back home, I would stop at various houses and share it out. Because in those days, many houses didn't have fridges or deep freezes. So our deep freeze was the community. And that connected us together. When, when I take some of the young folk out around here or on the Firth of Clyde where I'm living, I say to them, take some extra mackerel back with you. That's pretty much the only thing you'll catch these days. But take some extra mackerel back and take it round to your friends, take it round to your neighbours, after, of course, they've learned to clean it so that it's all nice and ready for eating. Do that, and that connects you in with who your people are. However, around 1970-71 in our area, a really bad thing started to happen. We would be going out and dropping down our lines, baited with mussels, and it would be as if it was an east wind blowing when it was even a southwest wind blowing. We would get nothing. My old mentor, Finley Montgomery of Ranish, would just say, very dead, very dead, and we'd up the anchor and go home. What was going on is that because of new technology like echo sounders and because of fancy new fishing boats supported with loans that had to be paid off the boats were coming in and fishing within the three mile limit and across the mouth of the sea loch and taking the younger fish that we would be catching the fishing became patchy and eventually it reached a point where nobody would bother going out anymore a connection between the youth and their maritime environment, indeed the whole community in its environment, was broken. At first, of course, we blamed the East Coasters. You blame everything on the East Coasters <laughs> if you're on the West Coast. And there was talk of, t of taking old cars and taking them out on rafts and dropping them at the mouths of the sea loch to snag their nets. And then gradually the hard reality broke in that these were not east coasters that were switching off their lights and coming in at night. These were our own local boats because a new ethos of competitiveness and of having to pay back the debt and having to have the lifestyle that went with it had come in and was breaking what we had. I saw exactly the same years later when I went with voluntary service overseas to Papua New Guinea. Except there it was the Taiwanese trawlers that came in and trawled the coral reefs and destroyed the very livelihood of those subsistence people. And so it was in the mid 80s when I came back for my second time in Papua New Guinea, having been involved in appropriate technology and renewable energy and that kind of stuff, microhydro. I came back to Scotland in which land was again moving up the agenda. There were tax breaks for planting Sitka spruce forest. Investors were buying up the land and pushing out tenant farmers. There was much talk but little action on land reform. And one day Tom Forsyth, a crofter from Scorrick, came to see me, then teaching human ecology at Edinburgh University, and said, we're trying to form an egg trust. Will you join us? I don't have time to tell that history now, most of you will know it, but the bottom line is that this time last year, 12th of June last year, we celebrated the 20th anniversary of the Isle of Egg Trust buyout. And a week on Monday, I'm going to be up in Ascent, where we're going to be celebrating the 25th anniversary of the Ascent Crofters buyout. And now we have 430,000 acres of Scotland's 19 million acres under community land tenure. So if you don't like your landowner, 
you can vote them out and stand for election yourself. That's the bottom line difference it makes. That's why in many of these communities like North Harris, Egg, etc., a new life has come back in because the fullness of community can now be lived again. Community of soil, soul, and society, the three S's are for this conference today of sea, soul, and society. Soil or sea, connection with our wider environmental community, the community of nature. Soul, the inner aspects, the psycholo psychology and even the spirituality of what makes for community. It's telling that the Ascent Crofters are beginning their celebrations in just over a week's time on the 1st of July with a multi-denominational service because that is the tradition that they are coming out of. Soil, soul and society. How do you grow back a maritime community? How do we treat young people in such a way that they are able to feel part of the place? Something like the Community Empowerment Bill is hugely important in that it is giving a signal from top down. It's basically the voice of central government over there in Edinburgh saying, we recognize the value of this. But precisely because it is talking about empowerment, it must be about opening up the wellsprings of what comes from below. It must be about creating community integration of soil or sea, soul and environment. So that you develop community cohesion. So that you develop the stability and even the economic affluence within communities that can allow people to remain as real people in a real place, to quote the Isle of Lewis poet Ian Crichton Smith. So what are the drivers of it? With land reform, the drivers are first of all housing. That when a community owns the land and it's not just being used for speculation to the highest bidder, the community can choose to make land available for social affordable housing. Huge benefit that allows families to live on lower incomes because they're not paying it over to the mortgage lenders just to get together 50, 60, 70 thousand pounds for the housing plot alone. Secondly, it can allow business to happen. I was looking at a short video on the Community Land Scotland website yesterday of the community in Makrahanish, who of all things took over a military airbase. You may remember that. They bought it for a pound because the MOD didn't know what to do with it. And I remember thinking, well, this one's going to be a struggle to make it work. But my goodness, there they've now got over 200 jobs being carried out based on economic activity they've brought in because they've got the land. So housing, business opportunity, Thirdly, energy and natural resources, whether it's renewable energy or, as with the Ascent Crofters, the sporting resources that are being used to create employment. Same in the North Harris Trust. And finally, most important, when we think about the sea, when we think about what the sea means, and that a number of the drivers I've just named don't apply to the sea in the same way, so we've got to really think hard what are going to be the drivers of maritime empowerment. The most important one are the psychological and I would say spiritual aspects. The aspects of profound interconnection to one another and to this earth that's at the heart of what it means to be a community you know when I go out there literally out in that sea just or just slightly up that way from this window here with young folks in my canoes I've got all the safety equipment I'll be in a dry suit I'll have the satellite beacon and what have you as well as the phone but it's also hugely reassuring to know that there's a kinghorn lifeboat just up there, 
and if I had to set up that beacon, in no time they'd be out there to rescue us. That connection is possible because a community of care exists, a community of people who know it's not just what you can take from a place that counts. It's not just that you can afford to come and buy a bit of the view that counts. What makes for community of sea, soul and society is that people are there to serve. The sea serves us with the food it provides, the beauty it provides, the means of transport and all the rest that it provides. That can only continue in a healthy way if we also serve the sea and its communities. And I close with one final anecdote. Sometimes I put my inflatable canoe in a taxi and go from where we live in Govan down to Renfrew Ferry over to Yoka there. And I'll put in there as the tide's coming in because the Clyde is tidal right the way up to Glasgow. Glasgow is a maritime community. And I'll paddle or maybe launch my umbrella and sail if the wind is coming from directly behind <laughs> in a fun sort of way back up to Govan and climb out where I get back there. <coughs> and then take the bus back up home with the canoe in my backpack. And a couple of years ago I went down there and as I was putting up the canoe I wasn't quite sure what the tide was doing and I saw a guy working on the engine of the Yorker ferry there. I went over to him and I said, do you know what the tide's getting up to just now? I forgot to take a look before I came out. Because the tide there, I've been caught in it. I mean, the tide there can run three or four knots, and in an inflatable, that's as fast as you can paddle. So you have to watch it, and I'd forgotten to check. So he told me what was going on. And he says, where are you from? And I said, well, I grew up in Lewis. So he puts down his tools, and takes out his tobacco, and rolls himself a smoke, and sits down. And of course, he's from Eriski. And he's running the ferry down there and he says, he points to my, I tell you, my plastic inflatable canoe. And he says, that's a proper boat. This thing isn't. Because his thing was made of square aluminium, it was a landing craft. But mine at least had the, li the right lines, even if it wasn't built like we build them in the Gal Gale. He says, that's a proper boat. That moves with the water. So I said, tell me about it. When did you first put to sea? He says, well, my father on Eriski, he used to take me out. And he said, my father didn't believe in engines. My father was always on the oars or with a sail. And I said, what did he teach you? And he says, well, I'll tell you how he taught me. From a young age, he took me out in the boat and he'd sit down in the thwart and he'd make me come alongside me and he'd put his arm around me and he'd make me put my arm around him so we'd be locked together and as it let up the sail as the boat rolled so we would roll together and that was how I learned to get the feel for the sea Friends, I put it to you that that can be what it means to grow up in a maritime community. And that spirit, that passing on from one generation to another, is how, in the kind of measures to be discussed today and tomorrow at this conference on empowerment in the maritime sector, that spirit is how we can grow back our maritime communities. Thank you.